Hello, everyone. Um, it's it's lovely to be here, and um, thank you to Inika and James for organising this fabulous conference. Right. Um, when Inika approached me to ask if I would like to give a paper at the Study Group 50th conference on my personal experiences, memories, and any thoughts on where the group might be in the future, I instantly thought of all the things that have made me laugh out loud or giggle incessantly, probably when I shouldn't have been, from attending the conferences over the last 27 years. And I think uh, Louise in the following paper will, in the following paper will be um, giving us you some more reasons, hopefully, to giggle. Once I had recovered my composure, I realised that my overwhelming memory of being a member of the group and of years of attendance at the study group conferences is one of enjoyment, but also support and an egalitarian openness by a genuinely diverse and immensely knowledgeable group of individuals who are passionate about their subject and sharing their knowledge. In this paper, I would like to show some examples of that inclusivity and how it is manifested through Article 3 of the Study Group con Constitution. So to start with, the open philosophy oops, of the group is seen in the membership policy as is stated on the Study Group website. Membership is open to all those interested in the study of Roman pottery, whether actively working in, researching, interpreting, or teaching the subject of Roman ceramics both professionals and amateurs. Additionally, um, now, uh, membership does not require you to be nominated by an existing member or to have your membership approved by a committee. For a modest annual cost, anyone can join who's interested in the subject. Now, as a caveat, this has certainly been the case since I joined in the early 1990s. All, uh, as we've just heard from Chris, is that um, my understanding is that it was not always the case, case in the early days of the group. Now, I should add here that there have been a few examples of demonstrating, how can I say, a hierarchy in the group, such as at the 25th conference at Hull, where there was a strict seating ban of a horseshoe table, shaped table based on how long you'd been at the group with those with the longest service at the middle and those who had most recently joined at the ends, you can see Louise, Rayner, and myself are just hanging on the end there, giggling with the single glass of wine we were all offered for the occasion. That's red wine, but uh, other colours of wine and soft drinks were available. I think the first study group conference I attended was at Durham in 1994, so my recollections are from the last 27 years. However, Despite the friendliness I experienced at the conference, it took me a few years to pluck up the courage to actually give a paper, and I have to admit that I was terrified, which is something I always recall when hearing papers given by new entrants in the group. So if there's any people like that today, you know, good on you, brilliant for doing it. My paper was met with kind comments and helpful advice, and although I won't be mentioning many of the group by name in this talk, it would be unfair, they're all fabulous. Um, I will make an exception, as other people have, here for the late Vivian Swan at this point. I was probably not alone in finding Vivian to be formidable in her knowledge and passion for her subject, so was not a little apprehensive when she put up her hand to comment on a lecture I had just delivered, especially as the subject was a kiln site, a topic that she could arguably be seen as the foremost expert in having written the book on Roman kilns in Britain, as Chris has shown. Anyway, I shouldn't have worried. Vivian could not have been kinder or more generous in her advice, and she continued her support over the years when I later wrote up the site publication. I offer this as an example of how the study group offers the opportunity for specialists starting their careers to be supported by the collective experience and the knowledge of others. Now this um, takes us to Article 3, and I'm sure, I'm sure as you all know, um, this is from the 2016 a revised edition of the Articles of the Constitution. So Article 3, the object of the group shall be to promote Roman pottery studies, disseminate the results and further the appreciation of Roman pottery across all 
possible audiences. So this um, article really has three objectives that I would like to kind of break down and explore in a bit more detail, showing some examples of how the study group has fulfilled these and its activities and ways of operating. So if we take the mode of the Roman pottery studies and disseminate the results, first of all, um, I'd like to kind of introduce, if, if you haven't actually seen the website, um, many of you who are new to the group may not have seen it. Um, so if you haven't visited it yet, I do re recommend looking through its pages. Just take a couple of hours because there's now a lot there. I'm only going to cherry pick a few items now as there are multiple resources on the website that are essential for anyone interested in the subject. As part of its remit to promote Roman pottery studies over the years, the group has produced or jointly produced a number of guidelines that you will now find on the website. I think it is important to stress that these guidelines are the guidelines for our profession. As with other ceramic groups, the study group sets the standards. One of the most recent examples of this is the publication, A Standard for Pottery Studies in Archaeology, as pre previously mentioned by Chris. It was jointly produced by the study group with the Prehistoric Ceramics Research Group and the Medieval Pottery Research Group. This is funded by um, Historic England. This is for use by all ceramicists working on excavated material, whether they be from community groups, universities or commercial units. So with a study group, you have an organisation that has a very broad membership that it actively encourages, but it's also one that is producing these professional technical gu guidelines for the industry that's funded by a government body. Included in the links on the website is one to the digitised gazetteer of the Roman Pottery Kilns of Rome of Britain. That is the result of an ongoing study group project to make this important work available to a wider audience and update the resource as new kiln sites are discovered. Increasingly, the website is either actively involved in creating or facilitating access to these resources, many of which are now out of print, such as the kilns volume or the National Roman Fabric Reference Collection. It is, not that long, it is not that long ago that if you were interested in studying Roman pottery, you would need to amass a very large library of books and journals, the most popular of which would quickly be out of print. The study group's utilization of the potential of online, online resources has meant that far more people can now have access to these key resources at no cost. So I'd also like who now brings the uh, John Gillam Prize. In 2004, an annual prize was established, the John Gillam Prize, named after one of the founders of the group. The eligibility for this prize is broad and encompasses all published and unpublished work as specified. On the website, it is a wide range of work that has had an impact on pottery found in Roman Britain and the continent is eligible so long as it was completed with the last two years. Nominations can include pottery reports, both published and growing literature, site reports, monographs, synthetic studies, websites, student dissertations, digital projects, theses, and so on. Any nomination must highlight specific aspects of Roman pottery from a technical, technological, regional, or thematic perspective. Now to date, a total of 15 prizes have been awarded. If we look at the recipients, though half are pottery specialists working commercially or in museums, four have been awarded to students for their academic work. This is important not only to have this work recognised for its merit and contribution to the discipline, but also to help those researchers who may want to develop a career in ceramic studies and do not have access to those platforms that established ceramic specialists have to disseminate the work and build their reputations. I have been very fortunate in my career to be trained by very experienced specialists and to have had the time to develop my skills surrounded by a team of ceramicists of all periods. Although there have been notable exceptions such as the Sifa Fines bursaries which addressed loss of skills within the industry and hopefully with the advent of workplace initiatives such as the Trailblazer apprenticeships, there are still too few opportunities for early career entrants to get the relevant dedicated training 
and experience to further their careers. Additionally, even if early career entrants do get opportunities to pursue their professions in a commercial environment, they may not necessarily get the necessary training or peer support that they need. This is where the study group is crucial to provide that professional support network. If we look at the Gillam Prize by publication type, it is interesting to know the range of avenues that are now being represented with only about half being either traditional hard copies, books or journal articles. We come to disseminate results. Um, the website can arguably come under the ban banner of disseminating the results, but there is also the Journal of Roman Pottery Studies that Chris has already spoken about today. Included in the modest annual membership fee is the peer-reviewed Journal of Roman Pottery Studies. The first journal was published in 1986 and a total of 18 volumes have now been produced. The level of professionalism and high academic quality is maintained through peer review and the editorial board. Beyond that, though, the format is wide ranging with volumes of short papers on various topics from contributors from the UK and abroad. Some are members of the study group, but not, not exclusively. Some journals are single topic reports, such as volume eight on the Roman pottery from um, excavations at Nura Brivae and volume nine on pottery from Rossington Bridge. There are volumes comprising papers from conferences, such as volume 10, based on a two day conference on Amphora held in 1994 and resource-based volumes such as the Mortarian Bibliography of Roman Britain. So there's a huge scope in the format and what is published, but all are ensured of being a very high academic standard. So coming to the last objective of Article 3. Further the appreciation of Roman poetry across all um, possible um, audiences and um, arguably the main conduit to further the appreciation of Roman poetry is through the group, group's conferences. These are open to members and non-members. Each conference is organised and managed by individual members of the group and with an understanding that to ensure that the event is affordable and accessible as possible, the costs are kept to a minimum. The cost of a conference has been substantially lower than any other, than any other archaeological conferences and this is in keeping with the study group's membership policy of embracing all interested parties. There has always been the understanding that for many of the group, they will be paying for the event themselves and not be supported by an employer. Additionally, there is a lower rate for students and there are also the Webster bursaries. The modest cost of the conference belie the high standards of papers, visits and events. The residential conference includes a trip out, usually on the Saturday afternoon, highly enjoyable and frequently exhausting. These visits anchor the conference in the history and the archaeology of the region and give context to the talks. I am sure I am not alone in looking forward to us resuming these trips when allowed and peering through a rain splattered coach window trying to ascertain if the ditch the cow is standing in is actually one of the earthworks of the Antonine Wall. As well as the outings, the schedules have included wine receptions held in museums or in town halls, such as Arras in 1998, an audience, um, an audience and welcome by the mayor of Glasgow in 2012, Roman kiln construction and firing, such as at no Nottingham and um, Carlisle. There is also the care and attention to detail, such as at the Norwich conference, when one of the tours was to one of the Saxon sh shore forts, Burg Castle. Our walk to the monument was structured so that we only saw the very impressive remains once we turned through a gap in a hedge, so you got the full impact of the structure. It was a nice piece um, of theatrical staging there. Originally, these two-day residential conferences would be held annually and in different parts of the United Kingdom and abroad, such as Arras, Ghent and Amsterdam. Over the last few years, this format has been adapted to a biennial residential conference alternating with a single day event in the intervening year. This change reflected the increasing cost of the conference facilities, especially at those universities, and the amount of work that is required to put together a successful conference. 
I would like to highlight our last residential conference here. In 2019, Jane Evans and Jane Fairs organized the very successful conference in Atherstone, which was centered on a collaborative project on the Mansetta Hartsville Roman Pottery Kilns archive. The pro project and conference were inspired by the enthusiasm and energy of the Atherstone Civic Society, Friends of Atherstone Heritage, and in particular, Margaret Hughes, who presented a paper. Many of the local community attended this event. We have always had members of local archaeology or community groups attend the conferences, and they've also helped hugely in opening up opening facilities or laying out pottery, for example. But I think this is the first when they were very much at the centre of the event. We have always, um, looking at the future, this model could be one that the study group should embrace and develop so that we open up to new, to new audiences by including them from the inception of the conference. As I mentioned earlier, there is such a real sense of enjoyment to these meetings of the group, especially the residential conferences, and I know that I'm not the only person to look forward to them, but also realise, having been involved in their organisations in the past, just how much it time, time it takes to create a successful, enjoyable and informative conference. So well done to Nico and James for this one. The Graham Webster bursaries. Uh, there are two bursaries named after one of the founders of the study group. They provide 50% of conference fees and 50% of travel costs up to a maximum of hundred pounds. To be eligible um, for these bursaries, um, the uh, requirements are actually quite broad and they recognize the breadth of the audience as they're open to students, part-time researchers, those who are retired or between posts. So I'm going to close here now, but I hope that I have demonstrated some of the ways in which the study group has fulfilled the promise of Article 3, our, how it has developed and adapted over the last 50 years to meet financial and societal changes, as well as those within the archaeological sector. Indeed, how some of the initiatives such as those seen at the Atherstone Conference could be developed in the future for our group to continue to become more inclusive and embrace different audiences. Despite the huge changes over the last 50 years or 49 within the archaeology sector, within all sectors, community, commercial, research and museums, the study group has remained relevant, open and welcoming in its objective to promote Roman pottery studies, disseminate the results and further the appreciation of Roman pottery across all possible audiences. Thank you.